Hi, it's Katrina. Mount Roraima. This plateau is known as the floating island of Venezuela. Its remote location and indigenous folklore make it the perfect place if you are looking for adventure. As the highest formation among South America's Pacaraima tabletop mountain chain, Mount Roraima is a plateau that sits among the clouds at 9,220 feet above sea level. Serving as the tri-point of the Brazil, Guiana, and Venezuela borders, Roraima is home to unique wildlife, including numerous species that are found nowhere else on Earth, as well as some of the world's highest waterfalls. This was said to have greatly inspired Paradise Falls in the movie Up. To the indigenous people, the plateau had mythological significance. It was a symbol, a place where all the world's fruits and vegetables grew on a great tree. But the trickster god chopped it down with his mighty axe, causing a great flood and leaving a huge stump behind. These tabletops are considered home to the gods, known as tepuis, but they have not been extensively explored. Its intimidating position and challenging terrain deter even the bravest of explorers. The climate is tropical and humid at the base of the mountain with an average temperature of 86 degrees Fahrenheit. Higher up, the plateau's weather is much different and the average temperature drops to around 50 degrees Fahrenheit. Here it rains pretty much daily and the mountaintop is home to various different types of forests where you'll find endemic plant and animal life including orchids, carnivorous plants, insects, birds, toads, and small reptiles and mammals. The plateau is an estimated 2 billion years old, making it one of the planet's oldest known geological formations. It was long considered a culturally significant landmark to indigenous peoples before English explorer Sir Walter Riley first described it to Europeans in 1595, and it is an integral part of many myths and legends. Today, Mount Roraima is a popular hiking destination for adventurous backpackers who are willing to undergo the arduous journey to reach a nearby village via dirt road before trekking for a day or two to reach the mountain's base and another day to ascend the plateau. There are often reported sightings of mysterious lights hovering in the area. Many people who scale Mount Roraima report experiencing altered states or intense feelings like some sort of spiritual journey. This natural wonder remains quite the mystery. East Scotia Ridge Located roughly 800 miles east of South America's southernmost tip in an isolated region of the Southern Ocean, the East Scotia Ridge is home to hydrothermal vents which consistently heat the water, reaching temperatures as high as 700 degrees Fahrenheit. At around 8,000 feet below the water's surface, life is completely dark here. Using a remotely operated vehicle, or ROV, British scientists explored the Little Steady region in 2009 and 2011 and discovered a plethora of previously unknown species, including hairy snow-white crabs, seven-armed sea stars that exist nowhere else on Earth, and a yet unidentified type of octopus. They also found new species of barnacles and sea anemones. Water samples showed that the hydrothermal vents emit life-sustaining bacteria and gases, but just the same, researchers were shocked at the abundant biodiversity that they encountered. Duke University Marine Laboratory Director Cindy Vandover told the Washington Post, It's remarkable that we can be in the 21st century and still not know fundamental things about what lives on our planet. At the same time, creatures that the team expected to cross paths with, including two worms, vent mussels, vent crabs, and vent shrimps, which are found in hydrothermal vents in the Pacific, Atlantic, and Indian Oceans, were nowhere to be found. Scientists believe that the Southern Ocean may act as a barrier to certain life forms, and that life on the East Scotia Ridge has been isolated for millions of years. Hang Son Dung Cave this enormous cave looks like the entrance to another world, and in a way, it is. Life in the cave has adapted to these conditions, and plants grow in some areas reaching toward cracks of light. Sometime between 2 and 5 million years ago in what is now Vietnam, the Rao Thuong River carved a cave into a 400 million year old rock formation. Known as Hang Son Dung, it's located within the Phong Nha Khe National Park near the Laos-Vietnam border and is widely considered the world's largest natural cave by volume and cross-section. Big enough to house a 40-story skyscraper, the cave's main passage is 3.1 miles long, with some sections measuring 656 feet tall and 492 feet wide. A local man named Ho Khan discovered the cave's entrance in 1991 while searching for valuable aloe timber. He was afraid to go inside, however, due to the sounds of whistling wind and a rushing stream coming from within. 
In 2009, a group of cave explorers from the British Cave Research Association conducted a survey, which led to Hang Son Doong gaining international recognition. During the exploration, the team encountered a nearly 300-foot-high calcite barrier, which they jokingly nicknamed the Great Wall of Vietnam. The following year, during their second expedition, the group traversed the wall and reached the end of the cave passage. The cave is so large, it even has its own weather system, with clouds lingering above. Last year, researchers confirmed the long-suspected fact that Hang Son Doong connects with a nearby cave called Hang Thong, effectively increasing its volume by over 56 million cubic feet. Inside the cave, explorers found unusually large baseball-sized cave pearls, as well as some of the world's tallest known stalagmites, measuring as much as 230 feet tall. Hang Son Doong is open to tourists for the steep price of around $3,000 each, and permits are required to enter the cave. Melville Range Rainforest In 2013, a team of scientists and filmmakers set out to explore a remote rainforest atop Australia's Melville Range. Located on the Cape York Peninsula in the country's northeastern region, the small, rugged, nine-mile-long mountain range's misty rainforest appeared in satellite imagery, prompting the researchers to go and see it for themselves. While there, the team encountered a new species of skink, a type of reptile which they named the Cape Melville Shade Skink. It's found nowhere else in the world, much like the blotched boulder frog. It has adapted special evolutionary traits to survive among the huge boulders of the Melville Range, including large eyes, which help it see better in the dim shade the rocks provide. The Cape Melville leaf-tailed gecko also has large eyes as well as long legs, which enable it to climb efficiently on the rocky terrain. Researchers believe that the wildlife here has been isolated for millions of years, evolving to suit the conditions around it. The frog and gecko displayed no fear of humans upon first contact, and the discoveries of these one-of-a-kind creatures remind us that the world is a much less explored place than we tend to think. Bosavi Crater Around 200,000 years ago, the cone of a now-extinct volcano in Papua New Guinea called Mount Bosavi collapsed creating a 0.6-mile-deep, 2.5-mile-wide crater, which is home to its own unique, isolated rainforest ecosystem. In 2009, an international team of scientists and a film crew working on the BBC wildlife documentary Lost Land of the Volcano ventured into the Bosavi Crater and discovered over 40 previously unidentified species endemic to the site, including 16 frogs, three or more fish, insects, spiders, a bat, and a giant rat measuring about 82 centimeters long, in other words, over two and a half feet, and weighing around 3.3 pounds or one and a half kilograms. That is a really, really big rat. Scientists believe that the animals living in Mount Bosavi's 3,280-foot walls have been isolated since the collapse of the volcano's cone, meaning they likely evolved to possess traits conducive to their survival down there. The crater is so remote that the nearby Kaswa villagers considered it inaccessible and possessed limited knowledge of what was inside. According to one village elder's take, if you fall when climbing in, no one will ever find your body. Sima Humboldt and Sima Martel Sima Humboldt, also called Sima Mayor, is a massive sinkhole located atop the 11,500-foot-tall Sari Sarinyama Tabletop Mountain, or Tepui, in Venezuela's Bolivar State. Similar to Mount Roraima, it's situated less than 3,000 feet away from another enormous sinkhole known as Sima Martel. These flat-top mountains are believed to be haunted by evil spirits that live in caves up at the top. Sometimes the evil spirit can be heard devouring human flesh, and then a spooky sound of sorry, sorry. A pilot named Harry Gibson first spotted the sinkholes while flying overhead in 1961. During the 1970s, explorers descended into Sima Humboldt and established that it has a depth of 1,030 feet, measuring 1,155 feet in diameter at its upper rim and 1,647 feet near the bottom. The smaller Sima Martel sinkhole measures roughly 814 feet deep. Due to their gargantuan size and depth, the sinkholes are thought to harbor their own unique ecosystems. To this day, Sima Humboldt and Sima Martel remain largely unexplored. Surrounded by dense jungle and hundreds of kilometers from the nearest road, the sinkholes are difficult to access. When researchers traveled into the gaping void of Sima Humboldt and noticed that it progressively widens, they had a complicated time getting out, to say the least. 
Any plant and animal life found within the sinkholes is likely very rare and unique, given the location's inaccessibility in a region that is already remote and isolated. Palawan Highlands Plant Life In June 2007, scientists exploring the highlands of the central Philippines discovered numerous previously unidentified species, including a large carnivorous plant, which they named Attenborough's pitcher plant. It ranks among the biggest of all pitcher plants and was observed consuming a shrew in 2012. Botanists have observed other bizarre plants in the area, including blue mushrooms, pink ferns, and a new species of a type of sticky trap plant called a sundew. I love those. The Attenborough's pitcher plant is only found on Mount Victoria in the Palawan province, between altitudes of 1,450 and 1,726 meters. Due to its extremely limited distribution and the ever-constant threat of plant poachers, the species is classified as critically endangered on the International Union for Conservation of Nature Red List. Mobile Cave Near the Black Sea in the Bulgarian border in southeastern Romania's Constanta County is an underground cave that has been isolated for around five and a half million years. Known as Movil Cave, the site harbors a poisonous atmosphere and is completely devoid of light, yet miraculously, it's home to a diverse ecosystem of creatures, including scorpions, wood lice, centipedes, and other creatures who have evolved uniquely due to their isolation and living conditions. The cave was discovered in 1986 by Romanian workers who were testing the ground's suitability as the site for a new power plant. Ever since, authorities have allowed less than 100 people to enter the cave, a dangerous undertaking that requires a 66-foot descent down a narrow shaft, followed by a series of limestone tunnels leading to a central cavern containing a lake. The pool of warm, sulfitic water stinks of rotting eggs or burnt rubber when you disturb it as hydrogen sulfide is given off, microbiologist Rick Bowden, who visited the cave, told the BBC. The atmosphere is rife with harmful gases and contains just 10% oxygen. Visitors face a 5-6 to six hour time limit exploring before they are at risk for kidney damage. Despite this, Mobile Cave is home to at least 48 species, 33 of which exist nowhere else on Earth. Scientists are studying how the numerous snails, shrimps, spiders, leeches, scorpions, and other life forms live in such an environment where the carbon dioxide content is 100 times higher than the air above ground. The creatures get their food from a layer of frothy, tissue paper-like foam on top of the water, which contains millions of bacteria called autotrophs. Since there's no light to serve as an energy source, the autotrophs rely on a process called chemosynthesis, which explains the cave's astronomical carbon dioxide level. While this ecosystem is the only known one of its type, its bacterial life forms are paradoxically simple and they function much like bacteria elsewhere, according to microbiologist J. Colin Murrell. On the other hand, the animals within the cave have evolved to possess features unlike any other known creatures. Most of them lack pigment and many do not have eyes because it's a pointless feature in a place with no light. It's also common for these animals to have extra long antenna and other appendages, which help them navigate efficiently in the dark. Lake Vostok Over two miles beneath the Antarctic ice, there is a massive ancient lake that has spent the last 15 million years cut off from the rest of the world. It's similar in size to Lake Ontario, but is around twice as deep. A Russian geographer and pilot first suspected the lake's presence during the 1960s while flying overhead and noticing a large, smooth patch of ice that sits above it. The discovery was confirmed in 1996 by British and American researchers using airborne radar techniques. Although Lake Vostok's mixture of salt and freshwater shows that it was possibly once connected to the ocean, it does not appear to currently have any other water sources besides meltwater from above, meaning it has likely been completely isolated from the world since the ice over it formed. Samples of accretion ice, or frozen lake water that forms on top of Lake Vostok's surface, taken during the 1990s by an international team of scientists, revealed the presence of microbes, suggesting that there's a unique ecosystem hidden beneath the ice, which has survived for hundreds of thousands of years without light. The discovery was surprising, as experts did not expect to find life in a place that lacks the conditions necessary to life as we know it. Almost as if it were on another planet. In more recent samples, scientists discovered genetic material belonging to over 3,500 species of microscopic organisms, including those that specialize in various stages of nitrogen and carbon cycles. The find indicates that Lake Vostok's ecosystem adapted to its changing conditions by evolving in ways that ensured its survival even after the water became completely covered in ice. 
Simply put, the lake appears to have established a way to survive by recycling its limited carbon supply, leading some researchers to theorize that this type of survival mechanism could facilitate life on the moon. Lake Vostok remains almost entirely unexplored, and the published findings aired on the conservative side, omitting any DNA sequences that scientists were not completely certain came from the lake's accretion ice. They believe that the subglacial water body likely contains a multitude of other organisms that are yet to be identified. Mystery Hole in Great Sphinx For centuries now, Egypt's Great Pyramids and Sphinx of Giza have frequently fallen under the spotlight for their mysterious voids and secret chambers. A famous void was discovered by the Scan Pyramids Project, an international mission under the authority of Egypt's Ministry of Antiquities. It was launched in October 2015. The program had detected several intriguing voids and anomalies using a special technique that uses the drizzle of subatomic particles called muons. Scientists can spot these with detectors that trace their 3D path and helps us look through solid materials to find empty spaces. The hope is that there are still large chambers full of ancient treasure. These rumors are encouraging archaeologists to get to the bottom of any possible truths behind the tales before looters do. In August 2019, the 4,500-year-old Great Sphinx made headlines yet again when reputed British historian Dr. Bethany Hughes claimed that there are two hidden chambers beneath the famous monument that are worth excavating for their potential loot and for the secrets they may reveal about ancient Egypt. Generations of ancient Egyptians came to respect and fear this otherworldly creature, really believing that it had supernatural powers, Dr. Hughes told The Sun. Archaeologists are investigating under the statue because there are tantalizing clues that the Sphinx sits right on top of an ancient network of chambers and tunnels. Shh, Bethany, don't tell everyone. Too late. At the base of the Sphinx near its tail, there is a small, deep hole which is typically kept hidden from public view. This hole could lead to the large chamber that some researchers believe is beneath the monument. Although researchers have yet to confirm any suspicions, Dr. Hughes believes that the tunnels below the Sphinx could be linked to a nearby pyramid, where the pharaoh Khufu is entombed. But she admits nobody knows for sure. The truth is, we have absolutely no idea what these were used for, but it's a mystery that researchers are currently trying to solve. White House Bomb Shelter During World War II, President Franklin Delano Roosevelt's advisors strongly urged him to move out of the White House. The commander-in-chief steadfastly refused. Instead, he had a bomb shelter built in December 1941 amid his already established plans to extend the White House's East Wing. While the East Wing's construction was public knowledge, the addition of the bomb shelter was kept secret, for obvious reasons. During construction, a temporary bomb shelter was erected at the insistence of the civil defense. This makeshift shelter was incorporated into the vaulted basement of the Treasury Building next door to the White House and was accessible via a newly dug tunnel. It wasn't the designated go-to shelter for long, however, because soon enough the permanent fixture was completed. FDR only inspected his so desired bomb shelter once, and it's understandable why. The structure is very basic, with a dreary concrete staircase leading down to a small, tomb-like room reserved for the president. Until recent decades, it was a tradition for every new president to inspect the shelter during his first day on the job. Today, the hideout is not considered as relevant as it once was. The Queen's Secret Passage Buckingham Palace is famous for both its splendor and its 775 rooms. Have you ever wondered how one efficiently navigates such a large home, especially someone like Queen Elizabeth II, who's in her 90s? I mean, it would take 20 minutes probably just to get down the hall. She uses a shortcut, of course, in the form of a secret passageway that provides easy access between the private apartments and the staterooms. There's an entrance to the passageway in the white drawing room, hidden behind a mirror and some other decorations. From there, the inconspicuous hallway leads to the Queen's private residence. But this isn't the only secret passage that Her Highness has at her disposal. There's also an emergency escape tunnel at Windsor Castle, which is accessible via a trap door concealed underneath some carpet. Queen Elizabeth did not commission this tunnel, however. It's been there since the castle was originally built during the 11th century, at a time when secret passages and rooms had more practical uses than they typically do today, and it looks the exact same as it did when it was first constructed during medieval times. Windsor Castle is just one of the Queen's various official residences, and its hidden passageway is undoubtedly just one of the many secrets these homes have. Wouldn't it be super fun to explore? The Ohio State Squatter this is plain old bizarre and proves that not all secret chambers hold high-profile secrets or are designed to house, serve, or give top-secret access to high-profile people. 
In 2013, a group of Ohio State University students sharing a multi-unit house began to joke about their off-campus dwelling being haunted as they kept hearing unexplainable eerie sounds, noticing doors left open that they had shut and experiencing an array of other strange inconsistencies. Before the fall term began, one of the residents, Brett Muglin, encountered a man in the basement whom he did not recognize. The man introduced himself as Jeremy and implied that he was the occupant of another unit within the home. Well, that's technically true. As it turns out, Jeremy lived inside the house, but not in any of the legitimately leased apartments. One day, amid the students' deepening suspicions relating to the strange goings-on in their home, maintenance workers knocked down a locked door in the basement that everyone mistakenly thought led to a utility closet. Instead, they found a furnished bedroom, complete with decorations like framed pictures and textbooks. As it turns out, the enigmatic Jeremy that Muglin had crossed paths with was living in the secret room. The house's real renters changed the locks and left a note on the front door, instructing Jeremy to contact them to schedule a date and time to collect his belongings. He was a nice enough guy, Muglin told OSU's newspaper, The Lantern, he just wasn't supposed to be there. The students blamed the home's realty company for its lax approach to changing locks between renters, and some even sought compensation for legal damages. Their complaints may seem petty considering how seemingly harmless Jeremy turned out to be, despite unfairly living for free while other inhabitants paid rent and went through an approval process. But the situation could have been much more dangerous, and the students considered themselves fortunate to have emerged from the situation unscathed. Jeremy could have been a serial killer. The Frick Collection Bowling Alley Located along Manhattan's Museum Mile at 70th Street and 5th Avenue, the Frick Collection is one of the Big Apple's most famous art museums. Completed in 1914, the Upper East Side Mansion is the former residence of steel magnate Henry Clay Frick. Shortly after the mansion was built, Frick commissioned the construction of an elegant bowling alley and billiard room, several floors below ground level. This little-known area was completed in 1916 and contains a combination billiard and pool table, as well as two bowling lanes. The original components are still there, and the original receipts survive as well, owing to Frick's meticulous bookkeeping, according to chief curator Colin Bailey, who showed the secret recreational chamber to CBS New York for its Inaccessible New York series. Frick passed away in 1919, and shortly after his death, his daughter, Helen Clay Frick, repurposed the basement space as a book and document storage area. The space was restored to its original state in 1997, and today it exists just as Mr. Frick knew and enjoyed it. Unfortunately, the area is closed to the public due to its lack of accessibility, requiring visitors to travel down several flights of stairs and through various twisting corridors. This complexity, coupled with only one exit, is considered a fire hazard, and it is therefore against city code to grant access to the public. That's the problem with hidden chambers. Great Pyramid Hidden Chambers Researchers have known for some time that the 4,500-year-old Great Pyramid of Giza contains hidden chambers, but exploring their contents without destroying parts of the structure or risking human safety is a rather complicated undertaking. In 2017, French scientists announced their plans to develop a specialized robot, which should be able to squeeze through a tiny 1.4-inch opening and explore a long, narrow passage leading to various inner chambers. The 100-foot-long void, which was discovered by an international team of researchers earlier that year, sits 230 feet high, directly above the Grand Gallery, which leads to the King's and Queen's chambers. Its purpose remains unknown, and as of early this year, scientists were still trying to find answers. In January, a team of Japanese researchers announced their plans to re-scan the pyramid with cosmic rays, more specifically with a technology called muon radiography that I mentioned before, which works similarly to X-ray imaging to confirm that the suspected void is actually there. The team is expected to finish taking the new scan at the end of the summer, but we'll see how that goes because it is 2020. Singer Castle Located on Dark Island in the upstate New York hamlet of Chippewa Bay, Singer Castle is a 28-room castle that was built in 1904 in a medieval architectural style. It was originally designed and constructed as a summer retreat and hunting and fishing lodge for millionaire Frederick Bourne, then president of the Singer Sewing Machine Company. The secluded estate, which overlooks the St. Lawrence Seaway and the Thousand Islands, contains elegant chandeliers, a marble fireplace, a magnificent wine cellar, and a grand entrance filled with knights of armor. Singer Castle also has numerous secret passageways and rooms, including one that is accessed by moving a bookshelf and where people can tip back a painting on the wall and spy on others through a hole. 
There are also grates on the walls that can be used for spying, and the dwelling has its very own dungeon, perhaps qualifying Singer Castle as the creepiest place on this list. Besides spying on guests, servants use these nondescript passageways for more practical purposes like efficiently traveling between dining rooms, especially during special dinners and events. Singer Castle changed hands numerous times following Bourne's death in 1919. It was renovated during the early 2000s and was open to the public for tours starting in 2003. Today, guests can spend the night for a steep $725, which includes a tour of the home and its secret tunnels. Joshua's Basement Room a pair of potential home buyers made an unpleasant and eerie discovery while checking out the basement of a house for sale in Michigan. A man and his son, who ended up posting about their bizarre experience on Reddit, noticed that there were numerous peepholes in the stairs they were standing beneath, enabling them to see into other parts of the house. They then looked at the walls and saw strange scrawlings, including the headline, Joshua's Rules, followed by statements such as, no watching Isaiah through the hole, and no writing or drawing on the walls. Things got even more bizarre when the gentleman looked at another wall and saw the message, Josh, stop reading this and go to bed, mom. Other scribblings included, don't climb into my room, Isaiah, and stop watching me. Were these ramblings and their disturbing accompanying peepholes the product of innocent child's play, or does the true explanation harbor darker undertones? Fellow Redditors had plenty of theories, including one commenter who chimed in, Joshua is not real. This is a family of schizophrenics. Conversely, another user wrote, the family isn't real, Joshua is schizophrenic. Whatever the case, I think it's fair to say that there's probably no logical or normal story behind this creepy cellar spy station. What do you think about these creepy child messages found in the basement? Let me know in the comments below. Secret Room at Mount Rushmore Mount Rushmore, the massive sculpture in South Dakota's Black Hills region, which bears the likenesses of former U.S. Presidents George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, Theodore Roosevelt, and Abraham Lincoln, contains a secret vault located behind Honest Abe's frontal lobe. Designed by Gutson Borglum, the monument sculptor, with the nation's history in mind, the hidden chamber is inaccessible to the public. Borglum had a grand vision for the room, which he envisioned as a space dedicated to the history of the United States. He wanted it to include carvings on the walls detailing America's most important historical events between 1776 and 1906, as well as busts of famous Americans lining the hallways leading to the vault. But Borglum's vision never came to fruition, and in 1941, the sculptor passed away. It wasn't until 1998 that officials decided to revive his dream of dedicating the chamber to American history. Today, the room contains several panels with sculptures depicting the story of Mount Rushmore and why its featured presidents were chosen. A chamber behind the Sphinx's ear? The Sphinx is rumored to have another secret chamber. It is a much less scientifically favored claim that there is a door behind the monument's ear leading to a secret room. While articles about this alleged door and chamber are difficult to come by from sources that are commonly regarded as credible, some pseudoscientists and armchair explorers assert that the supposed entrance has been hidden in plain sight for thousands of years. If you zoom into the Sphinx's ear, it seems almost like there is some sort of hole or entrance, but there is no definitive confirmation. Yet. This amateur theory stems from the claims of a young Russian boy named Boris Kiprianovici, an alleged prodigy who reportedly possesses a complete memory of the collective human past. Boris, who is now 24 years old and a self-proclaimed pilot from Mars during one of his past lives, has matter-of-factly told audiences that the world was once home to unimaginably advanced human civilizations. Included among them were the builders of the Sphinx. And when this monument is unlocked via a mysterious mechanism located behind one of its ears, life on Earth will change in major and currently unfathomable ways. Maybe someone opened it this year. Those were the only details the little boy with a presumably large imagination provided. Nevertheless, conspiracy theorists latched onto his claims and they continue clinging to these far-fetched beliefs for dear life. To their credit, there is a noticeable anomaly behind the Sphinx's right ear, which looks like an opening partially blocked off with a rock. Could it be a secret entrance leading to the locking mechanism young Boris mentioned? Or is it perhaps the result of normal wear and tear? Or maybe even a passage or door to a chamber containing valuable ancient Egyptian artifacts? I'm sure an archaeologist would be willing to check it out. There are a lot of things still left to be discovered about the Sphinx. Basilosaurus 40 million years ago, a fearsome, sharp-toothed creature named the Basilosaurus roamed the Earth. Although its name means King Lizard, the creature was actually a predatory whale. 
Originally discovered in a shallow sea in what is now Alabama, the skeleton of the first Basilosaurus ever found was so long and slender that it looked like a snake. According to a study published in January 2019, the Basilosaurus was a fierce predator. At first, scientists thought it was an aquatic reptile, but by studying the animal's teeth, scientists discovered it was actually a mammal. Known to be the largest meat-eater of its time, the Basilosaurus went extinct as the climate changed. Because most of the bones have been found in Alabama, the creature is now the state fossil. However, a slightly smaller species of the Basilosaurus was found in Egypt, where paleontologists discovered fossils of hundreds of this species 140 kilometers southwest of Cairo. See, not just pyramids over there. After analyzing the remains at a museum in Germany, researchers discovered the remains of a baby Dorodon, an ancient whale that lived 40 million years ago inside the stomach of a Basilosaurus. But researchers wanted more evidence that the Basilosaurus was a predator, and after examining the bones of the prey, they found evidence of bite marks on the Dorodon's head. I think that's good enough, right? Having gone extinct 35 million years ago, this king of lizards was believed to grow to up to 60 feet long, although there's still a lot unknown about the Basilosaurus, including its color and behavior, this long-lost predator was definitely a terrifying beast. Dacosaurus even though it doesn't look like one, the Dacosaurus is a true prehistoric crocodile. A strange creature that looks like a cross between a Carnosaur, which is similar to a Tyrannosaurus, and with the body of a Mosasaur, an extinct marine reptile, the Dacosaurus is definitely one of the more interesting looking prehistoric creatures. With a pair of primitive flippers, the Dacosaurus was not a very strong swimmer, although it is believed it was probably fast enough to catch prey, including fish, shellfish, and squid, this prehistoric crocodile was about 15 feet long and weighed around 2,000 pounds. First discovered in the mid-19th century, its name means tearing lizard. It lived approximately 150 million years ago from the late Jurassic period through the early Cretaceous period. Its strange makeup is believed to be the result of the creature evolving into something else. Researchers believe it was beginning to adapt to the shallow seas around North and South America, which give it its distinctive look. Mosasaurus The first skull fragments of the Mosasaurus, a prehistoric reptile, were found in the Netherlands in 1764, but it wasn't until a retired army physician discovered more remains that the hunt for the creature's origins really heated up. First believed to be a crocodile and then later mistaken for an ancient sperm whale, the Mosasaurus is believed to have evolved from monitor lizards. In 1808, a naturalist compared the anatomy of the unknown bones to others and identified the creature as an aquatic one who had flippers, not feet. A large creature with a heavy build, the Mosasaurus is believed to have a preference for larger, slower prey, most likely other marine reptiles. With side-facing eyes, it meant that the Mosasaurus had poor vision, and studies suggest it did not rely upon gauging distances between itself and prey when it went hunting for food. Its fossils also show that the olfactory bulb, the part of the creature that processes smells, was one of the most poorly developed areas in the creature. This led investigators to believe the Mosasaurus didn't necessarily use smell to detect injured prey when looking for an easy meal. Because of this, scientists believe the Mosasaurus possibly swam in the upper ocean and waited for other marine reptiles to surface for air. After using its tail to provide a quick burst of speed, the Mosasaurus then launched a sudden attack at their prey. Marine reptiles, fish, including sharks and even other dinosaurs were part of the diet of the Mosasaurus. The carnivore, which can measure from 15 to 18 meters long, was often found in Western Europe and North America and remains an impressively large oceanic predator. Liviaton Often compared to the sperm whale, the Liviaton is an ancient mammal that was discovered in what is now known as Peru. Because only partially preserved skulls, lower jaws, and teeth have been found, the creature is often compared to the sperm whale. Because of this, the size of the Liviaton has only been estimated, but it comes in at about 13 to 16 meters long, which makes it comparable to the size of megatooth sharks. An apex predator that fed upon small prey animals, which compared to the Liviaton were medium-sized baleen whales, the creature had teeth that were larger than the megalodon, the massive prehistoric shark. Since a full set of remains for the creature has never been found, scientists can only speculate about its behavior, but it is believed they hunted by approaching from the bottom and slamming into their target from underneath. But you can't forget about those teeth. Measuring 36 centimeters long, the teeth of the Liviaton were considered to be the largest known teeth for the purpose of eating. Because of this, scientists also believe that the Liviaton could have trapped smaller whales' ribcage between their jaws and crushed them with those massive teeth. 
Similar to the modern sperm whale, the Liviaton had an organ that was filled with wax and oil that scientists believe the creature may have used in echolocation to find its prey. Even if you've never heard about the Liviaton before now, which I doubt, knowing that the species name L. Melville, in honor of author Herman Melville, who wrote Moby Dick, may give you an idea of just how large and scary this predator really was. Nothosaurus in the middle of the Triassic period, about 240 million years ago, a family of marine reptiles known as Nothosaurus lived in the oceans of the world. Not fully adapted to life in the water, some Nothosaurus had clawed feet, meaning they could still walk on land. With long teeth to catch fish, Nothosaurus is believed to have hunted in the water and then went ashore to rest like a seal. With a long, flat head and very long jaws, the Nothosaurus had a head like a modern crocodile. Its needle-like teeth were adapted to grip fish, but they were not very good for chewing. Its flexible neck helped it to swing its jaw side to side to snap up nearby fish, and each of its forelimbs ended in five long clawed toes, which helped them scramble over slippery rocks on the shore. Its long, streamlined body helped the Nothosaurus swim efficiently through the water, and it used its long tail and webbed feet to push it forward through the current. Also similar to sea lions, the Nothosaurus gave birth to live young instead of laying eggs. Believed to have lived in the middle to late Triassic periods, Nothosaurus evolved from terrestrial reptiles that were distantly related to lizards and snakes. About 10 feet long, Nothosaurus may have evolved into plesiosaurs, large marine reptiles. These creatures were not dinosaurs, but that does not make them any less impressive. Titanoboa the name of the Titanoboa, a 40-foot-long snake found in Colombia, 60 miles from the Caribbean coast, says it all. Weighing more than a ton, the giant serpent looked like a modern-day boa constrictor, but huge. A swamp dweller and fearsome predator, the Titanoboa, the largest snake ever found, was nearly as high as a man's waist at the thickest part of its body. If that isn't the most remarkable thing about the Titanoboa, the fact that researchers were able to find it at all is equally impressive. When snakes die, their skulls fall apart and their bones are lost to the elements. However, the remains of the Titanoboa found in 2011 by paleontologists gave the researchers the ability to compare Titanoboa to other snakes, so that way they could figure out where it sits in the evolutionary timeline. Found in one of the world's largest coal operations, the fossil was just one of countless specimens uncovered in the Cerrejón region. Known as one of the world's richest, most important fossil deposits, scientists have found a window into an ancient tropical ecosystem of plants and animals. Back when Cerrejón was just a swampy jungle, deep water flowed through the area that was teeming with turtles that had shells twice the size of manhole covers and crocodiles that were more than a dozen feet long. But the Titanoboa was truly the lord of the jungle, and the discovery of its skull will help scientists to determine more about its size and what it ate. As work continues in the colossal mine, every day is a new discovery as material is trucked away. Underlying mudstone is unearthed, and fossils of exotic leaves, plants, and the bones of fascinating prehistoric creatures are revealed. Helicoprion This sea beast could weigh up to 1,000 pounds and measured about 13 to 25 feet long. But the most surprising thing is the helicoprion's spiral-shaped teeth. It's taken a very long time to recreate this creature and what it looked like 290 million years ago. A Russian geologist first named the creature, which means spiral saw, based on a fossil fragment found in Kazakhstan in 1899. But where did this spiky spiral belong? Initially, the geologist believed the fossil came from the fish's mouth and curled upward along the snout. But an American paleontologist found it hard to believe that the strange whorl protruded from the fish's teeth and instead guessed that it came from somewhere along the fish's back and was used as some sort of defense mechanism. Further speculation continued until 1907, when a zoologist found a better preserved fossilized specimen that actually showed the whorl in the jawbone of a helicoprion. In 1950, another specimen was discovered by a Danish paleontologist. With 117 serrated tooth crowns sitting on a spiral, scientists finally had evidence that the whorl was contained inside the helicoprion's mouth. But how? Artist and amateur helicoprion specialist Ray Troll reported to National Geographic in 2011 that the classic image of the whorl wasn't correct and that the helicoprion would be getting a makeover. Researchers from Idaho State University used CAT scans and made 3D virtual reconstructions of the jaws of the helicoprion, showing that the teeth were within the jaws, finally revealing what it looked like and how it ate. Also, it turns out that they are more similar to ratfish than to sharks. 
They used the whorl to create a rolling back and slicing mechanism which was perfect for eating squid. Over the last 50 years, researchers have continued to investigate and now suggest that the whorl either extended awkwardly from the lower lip, curled under the chin of the creature, or that it could have sat inside the mouth or possibly even further down the creature's throat. After further reconstruction, a team of scientists found that the tooth whorl was part of the lower jaw and was similar to sharks, who have multiple rows of teeth that are continuously replaced. The teeth are thought to be concealed in a spot near where the helicoprion's upper and lower jaws meet. As the teeth continued to grow and were pushed towards the front of the jaw, they eventually spiraled to form the base of newer teeth. So how did they use these remarkable teeth? Researchers believe that after the helicoprion closed their jaws, the creature would push the material back with the whorls of their teeth, slicing and forcing the food to the back of their mouths. They also believe that their jaws could have extended past 50 centimeters long and contained upwards of 150 teeth. As experts continued to study the fossilized material, they came to the conclusion that the helicoprion was not a shark but a chimera, part of a group of fish that branched off from sharks 400 million years ago. So although the structure of their teeth are very common to that of what modern sharks have, the helicoprion is indeed a unique species all its own. Sarcosuchus The biggest crocodile that ever lived, the Sarcosuchus is believed to have kept growing at a steady rate throughout its lifetime. The creature, whose name is Greek for flesh crocodile, is believed to have reached a length of up to 40 feet from head to tail. When you compare that to the 25-foot maximum for the biggest crocodile living today, Sarcosuchus is an impressive beast. Weighing more than 10 tons, the creature is not believed to have hunted other dinosaurs for food, but that doesn't mean that they didn't get into a prehistoric rumble every now and then. The size of the Sarcosuchus would have been more than capable of breaking the necks of large dinosaurs. By studying the bones of the prehistoric creature, it was easy for scientists to determine that their eyes didn't move left and right, but up and down instead, indicating that they spent a lot of time submerged below the surface of the water scanning for food. Still, it might surprise you to know that the super croc dined mostly on fish. Believed to have roamed the Earth over 100 million years ago, the Sarcosuchus was a reptile that lived in northern Africa where the Sahara Desert now lies. Although the nickname Super Croc might lead you to believe that Sarcosuchus was a direct ancestor of crocodiles, it was actually an obscure type of prehistoric reptile known as a Pholidosaur, which are similar to crocodiles but went extinct millions of years ago. Covered in armored plates, the only place on the body of the Sarcosuchus without these plates were its tail and the front of its head. The biggest crocodilian that ever lived, the Sarcosuchus, a 40-foot powerhouse, is an impressive relic of the Mesozoic era. Quetzalcoatlus Named for an ancient Mesoamerican deity, the largest species of Quetzalcoatlus was actually the largest of all flying creatures to have ever soared the skies in prehistoric times. These large flying reptiles lived between 144 and 66 million years ago and were around for roughly 80 million years. The creatures had a long pointed skull, long neck, and small torso. Known as a predatory animal, Quetzalcoatlus were portrayed as the giant vulture that scavenged for the carcasses of other dinosaurs. Because most of their fossils have been found inland, researchers at one time believed the large pterosaurs, or flying reptiles, were believed to have also been skimmers who hunted for fish in freshwater areas. But after further study focusing on their jaw and neck structures, scientists concluded they would need to dive for prey or scoop fish from the surface of the water. Even though Quetzalcoatlus had a small torso, they are believed to have been able to launch themselves off the ground and travel non-stop for thousands of kilometers. They also had thin wings, but they were packed with dense muscle fibers that required them to only flap occasionally to keep themselves airborne. With two species, one that was midway in size between the Tyrannosaurus and Raptors, the larger species of Sarcosuchus stood as tall as a giraffe. While fossils of the Quetzalcoatlus are scarce, it has been up to scientists to reconstruct their skeletons by comparing them to close relatives. Still, this animal, with its impressive aeronautic abilities and titanic reputation, helps Quetzalcoatlus live up to the reputation of its feathered serpent namesake. The Megalodon even though it went extinct millions of years ago, the megalodon still remains one of the ocean's most feared creatures. Known as the largest predatory shark ever recorded, the meg, whose name means giant tooth, died out long before humans evolved. Because their fossil record is incomplete, it's hard to pinpoint exactly where the meg went extinct. But when a research group at the University of Zurich studied fossils to determine their age back in 2014, they found most dated back from 15.9 million to 2.6 million years ago. After that, all signs of the creature's existence ended. 
By looking at the size of their teeth, researchers believe the megalodon could grow up to 60 feet long, while others think they reach up to 80 feet. To compare, modern great white sharks reach an average length of about 20 feet max. Since most of the fossils that have been found are teeth and not bones, their size is purely scientific speculation. But with teeth that can measure up to 7 inches in length, almost three times longer than the teeth of great whites, their massive size is still kind of mind-blowing. Even more fascinating is the fact that megalodon teeth have been found all over the world and in great quantities. Seen as a predator at the very top of the food chain, megalodon fed on other large marine mammals like whales and dolphins. But their evolution alongside those whales, who had the ability to regulate their temperature of their bodies to exist in colder water, which the megalodon could not do, is what scientists believe led to the extinction of this king of the ocean. Diavik Diamond Mine Located about 190 miles northeast of Yellowknife in Canada's Northwest Territories, the Diavik Diamond Mine is a remote diamond mine situated in a subarctic landscape consisting of two open pits with a depth of over 600 feet and a gravel airstrip. Mining operations began in 2003, and the site is expected to have a 16 to 22 year lifespan. The mine produces around 7 million carats of diamonds annually and is a major part of the regional economy, employing over 1,100 workers. Underground mining began in 2010, and in 2012, the transition from open pit to underground mining was complete. Getting supplies to the mine is a somewhat tricky operation as it's only accessible by air or via a seasonal ice road from Yellowknife. The logistics have gotten extra complicated before, including in 2006, when roads froze late and thawed early, forcing Diavik and other nearby mines to have the remainder of their supplies flown in. The largest gem-quality diamond ever discovered in North America was mined at Diavik in August 2015. Because Diavik is known for unearthing mostly small diamonds, this one almost got thrown away for its size under the assumption that it was kimberlite. Known as the Foxfire Diamond, the 187.63 carat gem was sold at auction for an undisclosed price to a man named Deepak Sheth of Amadina Investments, who made the unusual move of permitting the Smithsonian to borrow it. Kimberly Diamond Mine Nicknamed the Big Hole, the Kimberly Diamond Mine is rumored to be the world's largest hole dug by hand, measuring 1.2 miles wide and 705 feet deep. Built by 50,000 laborers, the pit is so large it is visible from space. Digging started in 1871, with tens of thousands of workers flocking to the site over the following year. They worked and lived in appalling conditions, including stifling heat and a lack of water and adequate nutrition. There was no proper waste disposal in their communities of basic dwellings that mining companies provided them with. Many miners died on the job. Over 22 million tons of earth and 14.5 million carats of diamonds were excavated at the big hole between the time it opened and 1914, when work at the mine ended. Englishman Cecil Rhodes, who founded the De Beers Diamond Company, profited handsomely from the yields at Kimberley. Today the site operates as a museum, welcoming visitors to learn about the history of the Kimberley Diamond and enjoy diamond and artifact displays. The thriving mining town that now sits empty is also open for exploration. Wooding Dean Well At 1,285 feet deep, the Wooding Dean Water Well is the world's deepest hand-dug well. Work on the well, which is located next to the Nuffield Hospital near Brighton and Hoven, England, began in 1858. Its purpose was to provide water to a nearby school and a workhouse, a facility where poor and orphaned people went to work in exchange for food and a bed to sleep in. The workhouse residents actually built the well with several men cramming into the less than four foot wide opening, filling buckets with earth and then hauling them to the top, while returning buckets full of bricks and mortar to the bottom. Some laborers worked naked due to the appalling conditions. They relied on candlelight using unstable ladders to scale the shaft. Over four years of construction, however, only one man fell and lost his life. When workers failed to hit water at 438 feet, the project's cost began to mount, despite the original cost-cutting intentions that inspired the Wooding Dean Well. Finally, at a depth exceeding the height of the Empire State Building, the water came up. Berkeley Pit Opened in 1955 by the Anaconda Copper Mining Company, the Berkeley Pit is a former open-pit copper mine in Butte, Montana that is filled with heavily acidic water contaminated with heavy metals and dangerous chemicals. The mining pit turned lake is one mile long and 1,780 feet deep, with the water filled to about 900 feet. 
When the Berkeley pit closed on Earth Day 1982, water pumps at a nearby mine were turned off, causing groundwater to seep into the now defunct pit. The water rose by about a foot every month until it reached its current depth. It is imperative for cleanup efforts to be made before the water reaches the current water table level, because if and when that happens, the pit water will flow into and contaminate surrounding freshwater sources, including Silverbow Creek, which acts as the Clark Fork headwaters of the Columbia River. The water is so contaminated, its current owner has mined copper directly from it. A flock of geese learned about the toxic water the hard way in 2016, when they sheltered at the lake during a snowstorm. Between 3,000 and 4,000 geese died due to exposure to sulfuric acid and heavy metals. Since then, officials have made it a point to deter and scare birds away from the site in hopes of preventing another tragedy. To slow the water's rise, the Horseshoe Bend Water Treatment Plant began diverting water from the pit during the 1990s. In September 2018, construction began on a new water treatment plant, which is slated to be finished within five years of the pit's water reaching the natural water table. However toxic the Berkeley pit may be, it's also a tourist attraction, complete with a gift shop and a viewing platform, which charges a fee for visitors to catch a glimpse of the contaminated pit lake. Would you visit this place, or have you? Let me know in the comments below! And while you're at it, be sure to subscribe and hit the notification bell if you haven't already. Chuki Kamata. Located in northern Chile at 9,350 feet above sea level, Chuki Kamata is the world's largest open pit copper mine according to its excavated volume of around 300 billion cubic feet. At 2,790 feet deep, it's the world's second deepest open pit mine. The pit measures 2.7 miles long and 1.9 miles wide. Chuki Kamata is situated above one of the world's largest known copper deposits. People have been mining copper here for centuries, as evidenced by a mummy dating back to 550 AD, who was discovered trapped in an ancient mine shaft. Large scale operations began in 1915, and in 1969, control of the mine was transferred from foreign to Chilean hands. The copper reserves at Chuki Kamata won't last forever. To take advantage of what's left, the site is being transformed into an underground mine, which will enable it to exploit the remaining resources until the year 2058. Bingham Canyon Mine Known as the Kennecott Copper Mine among locals, the Bingham Canyon Mine in Utah's Oak Hair Mountains outside Salt Lake City is the world's deepest man-made open pit, measuring 0.75 miles or 3,960 feet deep. At 2.5 miles wide and occupying around 1,900 acres total, it's also the world's largest man-made excavation. Two brothers, Sanford and Thomas Bingham, first discovered copper ore at the site in 1848, and ore extraction began in 1863. Over 19 million tons of copper have been produced at the Bingham Canyon Mine, arguably more than anywhere else in the world. Currently owned by the British-Australian multinational corporation Rio Tinto Group and managed by the Kennecott Utah Copper Corporation, the mine has officially been in operation since 1906 and has changed hands several times. By the 1920s, around 15,000 workers lived in communities in the canyon. As the mine grew, these residential areas were swallowed up. Kennecott Copper Corporation owned Bingham Canyon Mine for much of its life, but British Petroleum acquired it following the 1973 oil crisis, and Rio Tinto purchased it after that. In recent years, Rio Tinto has undertaken efforts to expand the mine for the sake of extracting more copper ore. More! We want more! Last year, the company implemented a $1.5 billion investment plan to continue operations until 2032. The move preserves hundreds of mining jobs that were otherwise slated to be eliminated in 2026. Deepest Holes in Antarctica Last year, scientists with the British Antarctic Survey dug a 7,060-foot borehole through an ice sheet in West Antarctica. It was the largest hole ever dug using a hot water drill and the deepest ever in the region. The hole was created as part of the Bed Access Monitoring and Ice Sheet History, or BEAMISH project, which aims to help researchers better understand climate-related sea level rise. It was a welcome comeback from a 2004 failed attempt at drilling a deep hole into the ice. An 11-person crew drilled for 63 hours to reach the sediment beneath the ice on the Rutford Ice Stream, a fast-moving glacier that deposits ice into the ocean. Once the hole was completed, scientists had to act fast to steady it before it froze shut. They took samples of sediment and dropped various instruments into the hole to measure conditions like water temperature, pressure, and deformation, hoping to gain a glimpse at how future climate change will affect the region. Moab Kotsong Mine 
Located in South Africa near the Vaal River, roughly 112 miles southwest of Johannesburg, the Moab Kotsong Mine contains one of the world's deepest mine shafts and man-made holes, measuring 9,800 feet deep or nearly two miles below the surface. Moab Kotsong, which has been operating since 2003, offers the world's longest elevator ride, transporting thousands of workers to the bottom of the shaft and back up every day. Nicknamed the cage, the triple-deck elevator holds up to 120 people at once, and the 450-story ride down takes several minutes starting out slow and gaining speed as it descends. Operated by Harmony Gold, the mine is located in a once bustling region that saw its mining industry largely abandoned as the gold supply dwindled. But instead of bailing, Moab Kotsong decided to dig even deeper. It produces just one quarter of the 60 tons it once yielded annually. Scientists are exploring at the mine in hopes of finding signs of life in places where it was previously thought impossible to exist and to study seismology by drilling into a fault beneath the mine which sparked a dangerous earthquake in recent years. Z44 Chavo Well Oil corporations are digging deeper and deeper to find the world's remaining oil wells, resulting in some of the world's deepest and longest wells being drilled in recent years. Completed in 2012 as part of the Exxon Neftegas Sakhalin 1 project, the Z44 Chavo Well extends 40,604 feet, or 7.7 .7 miles, below the Earth's surface. Located on the Sakhalin shelf in Russia's Far East, the shaft's depth is equivalent to 15 Burj Khalifas, the world's tallest skyscraper, piled on top of one another. The well narrowly defeated the company's previously set record for the world's longest well, the Odoptu OP-11 well, which has a depth of 40,502 feet, or 7.67 .67 miles. Altogether, six of the world's ten record-setting extended-reach drilling wells were drilled in the Sakhalin 1 project's fields since 2003. As some critics of record-holding wells point out, many of these shafts have what's known as horizontal displacement, meaning they descend into the ground at an angle rather than strictly vertically. In other words, their measured depth according to this downward angle does not necessarily reflect the bottom of the hole's vertical distance from the surface. Project Mohole In 1958, American engineers attempted to retrieve samples of the Mohorovicic discontinuity, or MOHO, the boundary between the Earth's crust and mantle, by drilling a hole through the Pacific Ocean floor in Guadalupe, Mexico. Founded by the National Science Foundation and run by a group of scientists called the American Miscellaneous Society, the project was controversial from the start, facing both political and scientific opposition, as well as mismanagement and cost overruns. While part one of the project was successful, differing views completely prevented segment two from commencing. The project was discontinued in 1966, when the U.S. House of Representatives ended funding before drillers could reach the mantle. Kola Superdeep Borehole In 1970, Soviet scientists began drilling the Kola Superdeep Borehole on Russia's Kola Peninsula as a way to one-up the U.S. Project Mohole. The Soviets drilled from 1970 until 1992, boring a 9-inch diameter hole extending 40,230 feet or roughly 7.6 miles into the Earth, making it the world's deepest man-made hole in 1989. Plans to dig even deeper were interrupted by higher-than-expected temperatures of 356 degrees Fahrenheit, which made continuing unfeasible. Drilling stopped, and the project officially ended three years later when the Soviet Union fell. Numerous discoveries and observations were made along the way during the borehole's creation. At four miles below the surface, microscopic plankton fossils appeared. A little further down, scientists noticed that the rock was saturated with water sourced from underground minerals, where it sat trapped beneath an impermeable layer of rock. At its deepest, the Kola Superdeep Borehole penetrates roughly one-third through the Baltic Shield continental crust, where it reaches rocks dating back to the Archean geological period, lasting from 4 to 2.5 billion years ago. Unfortunately, the Kola Hole closed down in 2005 and was partially filled in with concrete. In 1990, the German Continental Deep Drilling Program, or KTB, began in Bavaria and drilled down to 5.6 miles. This huge drill rig is still there and can be visited by tourists. Dutch artist Lottie Given wanted to record sounds in the Kola borehole, but discovered it was closed. Instead, she was able to lower the microphone down the German hole to see what the earth sounded like. Everyone expected it to be silent, but instead she captured a deep rumbling like thunder that made the hair on her arms stand up straight. Exactly what the sound is 
is still a mystery. Thanks for watching. Now that you've learned about man-made holes, would you like to learn about some of the Earth's deepest natural holes? Let me know in the comments below and be sure to subscribe if you haven't already. See you next time. Bye!